Morning, friends. Welcome to Seed Starting Saturday. It is your friend Lisa Mason Ziegler here today, and we're going to have some fun here this morning, folks. Um, in addition to sowing our weekly sunflower seeds, we're also going to be looking at when is the right size, what is the right size to plant out soil blocks, as well as I'm going to do a little pension right here live with you guys today. So I'm just checking to make sure we're live everywhere. I think we're coming through. We are. And so, friends, I don't know where you're located. You know, we're here in southeastern Virginia, and we had a scorcher week. And I will tell you, it kicked my butt, um, as I know it did a lot of other people. And I'm still kind of recovering from it. And so I just tell folks that, there really are ways to work with the heat. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that while we're sowing our sunflowers this morning, because it is basically survival mode for flower farmers or anybody that works outside. And also if, you know, you're trying to produce a product that's going to last. So we'll be talking about that um, a little bit too. So I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. First off, if you're new here, welcome. Um, if you want to learn more about the Gardener's Workshop and the work that we're doing, um, you can find everything over at thegardenersworkshop.com. And that's kind of like the clearinghouse of everything we have, friends. And we have a lot of stuff. I had, I'm working on, um, working with a reporter or a writer um, that I've worked with in the past and she's now writing for somebody again and wants to, is doing an article on farmers. And so I, she, I just love the format of the way she does things. She sends you these great questions so you can answer them. So there's never any errors. Anyway, one of them was list all the things that you guys are doing. And oh my gosh, y'all, when I sat down to list all the things that we have available um, for our friends and followers, it just blew my mind. So get on over to thegardenersworkshop.com. There are a ton of free resources. There are cohesive online courses. We have big schools. If you're starting a business or in business and you want to expand, scale, start, whatever you want to do. Um, so you can find all that over there. And I also encourage you to sign up for our farm news. That's our e-newsletter. And it comes out every Wednesday at four o'clock. And it's like headliners of all the different things that are going on, new products, um, a how to, what the latest podcast might, we have like three podcasts a week that come out friends. Um, what is our podcast? It's the field and garden um, podcast, and you can find it on any app that you are, is your favorite kind of listening. So I also want to remind everybody that this coming week, um, today is what, June 4th, this coming week, June 9th, um, Dave Dowling's course, Bulbs, Perennials, Woodies, and more goes on sale or the enrollment opens. Friends, this only happens once a year for five days. Our schools are like six weeks long and are super interactive. And that's why it only runs once a year. And yes, we are running it in season because this is the number one student request that we got from his past students is to have this course during the period that they should be ordering, planning and planting this group of plants. Um, and so folks, if you want to know more about that, you can learn about it over at thegardenersworkshop.com. And next Saturday, right here in this time slot, um, we're going to have some special guests. And I invite you to join me. It should be super interesting and in, you know, kind of like encouraging, right? And so I just, I'm just reading. And if you have missed it, the podcast that came out this morning was Peonies 101 with Dave Dowling. Um, Dave, if you don't know who Dave is, or if you haven't experienced learning from Dave, Dave Dowling um, is a walking encyclopedia. And that, are, that is no exaggeration about him. He is absolutely his depth of knowledge in all areas of growing and being in the cut flower business 
is just endless. You just can't believe what you learn from him. And that's why his course, Bob's Perennials, Woody's, and more. And the more is he gives you like an introduction to growing in structures. Um, it's not a deep dive, but friends, Dave will blow your mind. If you are a flower enthusiast, um, a serious gardener, Dave's course is one of our big schools that I say even gardeners benefit. Um, so you don't want to miss out on it. And Dave has an amazing teacher's heart and all this knowledge. And that's what makes him such a phenomenal teacher. And you're going to see all kinds of stuff happening in the next 10 days of us talking to his students. You know, how did it help? What did you think about it? Um, and anyway, so I don't, but you want to definitely at least get on our farm, our farm newsletter. You can sign up to get on Dave's wait list also. So you're sure to not miss out on anything. So I want to start off today by doing our sunflowers. Um, so it's weeks like this when you're just absolutely exhausted, friends, that you start letting things slide. You cannot let your sunflowers slide, friends, because the sunflowers we start today are going to be blooming in 60 days. That's how far ahead you have to think. So I am back to the colors that I start pretty much. I mean, I may change it up a little bit every now and then, but in general, from here on out for the next few weeks, I'll be starting Pro Cut Orange, Pro Cut Gold Light, and Pro Cut Sun Fill. Sun Fill is that sunflower that we don't grow it for it to be open like these sunflowers you see sitting behind me. We grow it for the actual bud head, which has been just hybridized to be such a different looking head. It looks like a succulent, y'all. It is such a great filler for bouquets because you can schedule them. So they're about 60 days, just like Pro Cuts. So that's what we're going to be starting. And if you're just joining with us today, sorry, friends, I have to get a little bit better situated here. Um, so I'm on the set today of where we do our shop and show. Usually this is all where those beautiful flowers are. If you've been joining us for our Friday at noon on our new phone app, um, the shop and show where we talk about show what's blooming and how you grow it and the seed and all that. Um, and anyway, so that's where I've got my plants out here. And I just need to get a little bit better out here because down here at my feet are all the buckets that the flowers go in when they're brought in for the show. So, all right, here. So let's talk sunflowers for a minute. Let's just do a really quick review for anybody um, that doesn't know about sunflowers. Sunflowers are the meat and potatoes of a flower farmer's business, or they can be. And Dave Down and I tell people all the time, people tech message us all the time and say, I want to expand my business. What else can I grow? You know, they're looking for that latest, greatest, newest, fanciest. Friends, if you are not planting sunflowers every single week, figuring out what colors you need for whatever market you're in, how many you need to plant each week and how to make them the size that your customers can really use or you use in your bouquets. Um, you, you shouldn't even be looking at other stuff until you wrap your head around this. And I will also add that um, in our staff meeting on Thursday, we were talking about succession planting. And Anne, one of our team members, added that sunflowers doing this is a real eye opener. And it helps people to wrap their head around and understand why you have to succession plant most all of um the annuals. And that's what we're going to talk about here. If I can get the tape off, y'all, I need some more masking tape. We talked about this yesterday. I mean, I just don't go to stores and all right, it's coming. It's coming. So I'm, I use masking tape with our garden marker. Um, this is a garden marker that's made to withstand UV rays and moisture. And the big reason that I really always mark my sunflowers so we know which ones are which is because the sun fill which we want to harvest long before petals are showing which is when you harvest normal sunflowers you need to know which ones those are right so i'm going to go ahead and put this tape down you know the tape might be the end of me um i sound a little raspy my 
allergies are raging. I sneezed all day yesterday and this morning and my ears are itching. Um, and so I'm sorry if I get a sneezing fit, I am exiting stage right and I'll be back. Okay. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think we'll put this right here. Um, so we start pro cut sunflowers um, because they're the quickest. They're very quick from seed to bloom, 55 to 60 days. Pro cut orange, when we were in high production for all of those years, was the only sunflower that we grew because it was way too much craziness. Um, I have a ladybug crawling across my, it may crawl right across the camera and y'all get to see her. Um, pro cut orange, when we were in high production producing or planting 1200 sunflowers a week for about 26 weeks, they were all pro cut orange. That is the classic sunflower. And guess what, friends? Our commercial customers bought the same sunflower every week, week after week after week, as did our farmer's market customers, our mixed bouquet customers. It simplified our life. I would never be doing this multiple different kinds of sunflowers once I go into high rolling business. So you have to really say, all right, you know, if you're just ramping up your business, go for it. But once you get crazy, just say, I'm starting one sunflower. Pro Cut Orange has the stiffest neck and is the most universal in demand. So that's what I would be doing. All right. So um, we start our sunflowers in 128 plug trays, which you can find them on our website if you need them. And um, the soil that's in this plug tray is just a 50-50 mix of a finished compost and any potting soil. Doesn't have to be anything special. You would never use your special blocking mix, um, which is just more intense to make it or more expensive to buy if you're buying it. So you that's not required for this. So let's see. I'm, so I'm going to start and we're going to talk. I'll talk about what I'm doing. I'm going to make it so y'all can see what I'm doing. And I want to talk about the heat factor because there are a few things that you can do to help yourself to survive heat. Let me just turn this down so y'all can see what I'm doing here. All right. Um, so I'm dropping one seed onto the top of each. I'm trying to. Um, dropping a seed on the top of each cell. And it's this time of the year, it's just one seed per cell. When we start probably in about four weeks, you may see me from time to time put two seeds in a cell because we know, or you'll know now, that we control the size of a sunflower bloom by the spacing we plant them in the garden. And as the days get longer in the heat of summer, the um, sunflowers can get bigger, even though you're doing everything the same you did that you did. And it's just because the day length is longer and the blooms get bigger and bigger. Um, so I sometimes, oh, I don't want to do that. I keep forgetting I'm not doing a whole tray of the same thing, y'all. Back when we were in high production, I would do 12 trays of the same thing. And it's sometimes hard for me to remember that it's not, you know, I have to like, you know, break this up into three different kinds. Um, so by putting two sunflowers in a cell and then continuing to plant them at the same planting that I'll tell you here in just a minute, um, it makes, it keeps the blooms a little smaller. Because let me tell y'all, nobody wants big sunflowers. I mean, people like seeing them in a garden, but nobody wants to use them in arrangements or in mixed bouquets or even a bunch of them. They're just too hard to use and um, it just doesn't work out very well. Um, so I'm dropping one on each and you'll see how I push that down here in just a second. Um, so the next steps are that I will, um, will, will complete the planting process. Then I'm going to take this tray into my grow room. I'm going to water the tray really, really well. And then I'm going to pop this tray up on to a seedling heat mat, which definitely makes more seeds germinate more evenly and quicker than if you just set them somewhere outside, even if it's hot where you are. Um, I'm just telling you the science of it, friends. That's just how it works. That consistent heat and steady heat um, just gets them to pop really, really faster. I will be answering questions um, 
at the end of our little session here. So if you put a question mark or say question, that helps me when I'm scrolling through. Um, I know that you guys love to talk to each other and I love your greetings. And if you're seeing people actually, oh, look at that perfect number. How about that? Um, if you're seeing people post their sunflower emojis, the sunflower actually reflects and identifies people as our online course students. And we love it when y'all do that. Um, that identifies other people and friends. If you are one of our online courses and you don't mind people reaching out to you to say, hey, did you like their courses? Are they helpful or how was it? Please give a shout out and say to people, hey, DM me, message me on Messenger or DM me on Instagram um, because word of mouth is the best way, right? All right, friends. So if you see what I'm doing, I'm just putting my fingers on the seeds and pushing them about halfway down in the cell because sunflowers germinate best when they are covered with soil, which creates darkness. And so I'm pushing them in. And so when I finish this process, if you look down in these cells right now, you still might be able to see some of these seeds. But when we take this tray into the grow room and when I water it, that's going to wash any of the soil, the soil from the walls um, down on top of the seed. So you don't have to do anything additional. The watering process will finish covering them. Pop them onto the heat mat. Once 50% show signs of life, that means if you see their necks coming, that is considered sprouted. When 50% of them are doing that, then I move them from the heat mat to either, if it's warm enough outside, which it is here for us, I've just put them right on out on our porch into full blasting sun, give them protection from varmints. If you need to, that would be birds, squirrels, and rabbits, either with a row cover or we put bulb crates upside down on them, although little birds can get through that. And then we plant them in the garden when they're two to three weeks old. How I kind of judge it is when we can pull on a stem and the whole cell comes out, that's you want it quick and easy. You don't want to have to dig out each cell. And if you're having trouble getting good, strong root systems, I would almost guess that your early sprouting conditions are not warm enough. That's where the consistent warmth of a heat mat really, really helps. So that's typically for me two to three weeks when we're going to be planting them out in the garden. We plant them into a garden bed that has already had the dry organic fertilizer. You can find that and every all the seeds and just about everything I'm talking about over at thegardenersworkshop.com. The dry organic fertilizer is chicken litter based and we put three, one cup, no, three pounds or three cups. You have to read the directions, y'all. I'm sorry, to 100 square feet. So we have all the directions for you. We apply it at that rate. We incorporate it. Then we plant our sunflowers. We do not lay down irrigation or biodegradable film. These sunflowers are going to be a third of the way through their life when they get planted. They're only going to be out in the garden for less than 40 days before you're cutting them and ripping them out or chopping them down or what, however you extinguish. Um, so we just feel like it's a waste. We plant them five rows to a 30 inch wide bed and six inches apart in row. And just a note, when I was saying I'd be putting two seeds to a cell later in the season, they get planted that same spacing. I don't separate them. You don't thin them or anything else. So we plant them, we hand water them in. And here in Southeastern Virginia, we get over 50 inches of rain a year. Um, so we get very frequent rain. So we literally just leave them until it's time to cut them. Yes, sunflowers will definitely, feeling a sneeze, y'all. Um, sunflowers will definitely benefit from support, flower support netting. Um, but we plant so many of them so often that we just can't do it. We can't keep up. So we just accept the risk that a torrential rain can lay some down. We might lose some. I have some um, crazy crooked ones in the garden right now from a, a storm last week. Sorry, y'all. Wait a minute. I should have brought tissue over here. If you're just joining me, my allergies are killing me. All right. Um, 
So we plant them out there, we water them, and then they're basically, we don't see them again until they're starting to bloom. Literally, it is that simple, friends. Um, and so sunflowers are an in-demand crop. You can float a bouquet business. If you have two or three sunflowers a week to puff up your bouquets of the proper size, not these big things that some people grow. I'll show you a really great example. Um, these are all the same sunflower. This is much more the size that I want. See how much bigger the one next to it? It doesn't look like much, but it would dominate. And the smaller sunflowers are what your customers want. And the smaller, the better for me. I mean, look at this guy. This guy's old, but look how small. That's the perfect size. He's old. And if you were lucky enough to get some of the Pro Cut Peach, that's peach is what these are. That seed is no longer available this season until they do their harvesting. I mean, look at this. That's the perfect size. That's beautiful peach, right? All right. So that's the story on sunflowers. So that's where how the rest of the story will go. Now, um, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about before we move on, um, I'm going to do some pinching of um, some snapdragons that are back here that I'm just going to show you what would happen. We literally just didn't get to plant these. And so they're kind of like leftovers. And I thought might as well make good use of them. Right. So we're going to do some pinching. Um, and but before we do that, I want to show you people are often saying to me, what when do you plant them out? What size blocks do you use? And so I have. I'm going to try to pick up a handful here. I don't want to destroy these picking them up, but I literally want to show you guys what we would do. So this is some Silphid Celosia. You can see it is in the small block, right? And this is the perfect planting size, three to five inches, y'all. Can you see this? And I'm not going to break them apart. You can see their roots. These are the perfect size to plant. These have been sitting outside on the carport, hardening off for over a week. Um, and they are going to do just beautifully. And yes, these guys in the center, this doesn't always happen. Um, these guys will just be planted at the same time. Um, so this, this is the actual just perfect size to take them to the garden. Y'all, I could just look at roots all day. Look at those roots. If these, let's see when these were started. Five, two. So these are just shy of four weeks, right? I haven't counted on the calendar, um, but they are four weeks old, which for our conditions, that really works really, really well. And so these are the peppers that we moved up together last week. Y'all look at these. Oh my gosh. I mean, I just want to take these in my house and watch them grow. So this is that special pepper that we're growing out to grow for seed um, that is hybridized for flower farmers. Look at those roots. So this, it was last week, I think. So if this had been in a container, we would already have circling. This is how soil blocks get air pruned. Um, I'm telling you, friends, it is just, let's look for a bigger one. So these pepper seeds were started. Oh, wow, wow, wow. First off, can you see the small block in there? So these were started in the small block to make the maximum use out of your heat mat and your grow light real estate. Then they were potted up to the two inch when they were about mm, two to three inches tall. But look at these roots, friends. I mean, this, do you have any idea Sorry, I don't like not seeing you. You can't imagine how quickly these just take off when you plant them. They don't have to recover from you ripping their roots all apart. So, you know, I don't often have so many. Oh, my goodness. I just want to pick up all of these guys. It's like I want to pet them. Not really. But you can just see the roots that are reaching. So these guys have been hardening off that we potted them up together 
last Saturday. Um, we will probably, we finally got our eucalyptus, which was potted up a three weeks ago, planted day before yesterday on Monday. Um, these guys will get planted this week. Um, and we just can't wait to share with how that all goes. So we're growing these for seed. This is an ornamental pepper um, that I got the seed from the Association of Specialty Cut Flowers does a, um, at their conference each year, does a research um, a research um, fund, couldn't think of the word. Um, and so they do a silent auction each year and flower farmers love to bring special stuff. Like I can remember one year, Bob Woolham of Woolham Garden, he's one of our just rock stars of the industry, brought one of his old hats, you know, and somebody paid a ridiculous amount of money. Well, I bought these pepper seeds. I'm talking 15 years ago. And what's cool about them is they're the red looking chili peppers, but they stand upright and they rise above the foliage. The most time consuming thing on most ornamental peppers is you have to strip them and it's a pain in the neck. These don't have to do that. So we are attempting to develop that and save the seed to make available first to our students and then to other people. Of course, this will take, you know, a couple of years, but anyway, so that's how that is going. So I'll talk about in just a minute, I'll show you the rest of these seeds up here. Um, so these are, again, let's look at these seedlings. Small block friends, look how healthy they are. These are snapdragons that are too old. These were started, you're not going to believe how old these are. May, I'm sorry, April 4th. These are eight weeks old. Let's have a look at these roots. I can't resist. We're kind of sacrificing these. So let's just do everything we can to them. So I'm going to pull them apart. And don't be afraid. Don't be gentle. Just rip these suckers apart. And I will tell you that I do find that using a plant wooden stake to cut them apart like a knife. Look at those roots. Do you have any idea how pot bound these would be eight weeks in a container? I mean, these are still very plantable because look how healthy the top is. Totally and completely. So we may have to plant these just to see how they do. So let's actually, I'm going to show you, I'm going to pinch. I have four trays of these. They're in different colors. Um, this is Opus, which is the snap that's supposed to bloom with long days, with more heat. So we're going to definitely test it. So where would I pinch these, y'all? I'm just going to go through here. And this is how I pinch. And I love doing this job. There you go. I'll show you all up close here in just a second. See if I can't get you down here. So I'm literally just mowing them down. So if you can imagine, so look at how much great exposure these pinched ones are going to be getting now. Um, when we did this years ago out of desperation because we just were having horrible weather and couldn't get stuff planted because of wet rain, we pinched everything because they were just growing so big. They were growing out of their trays and we, and then they had to sit there for two weeks we had the healthiest transplants we have ever grown, y'all. Um, the sturdiest. That's what I can still remember Libby coming in and saying to me, of all the transplants I have ever planted on this farm, those were definitely the healthiest. So, and I know the question's going to come and I'm going to say, yes, some of the, some annuals you can root this way. Um, but it's, we wouldn't even be thinking about doing that. I have no idea if you can do it with snaps. Um, so there you go. Want to have a closer look? So now what my plan would be is to let this tray sit and recover for at least about seven days. And what I'm looking for is right here where right below where I made the cut is where little sprouts are going to show. And when the sprouts show up, that says to me, hey, we're recovered from what you just did to us. I mean, we just cut their top off, right? I mean, look at all of this. 
Um, so that is how you pinch. You can pinch any annual that's branching. I mean, you just have to know um, that's something that you need to figure out about the different varieties that you're growing. Is it a brancher? There is some coxcombs that are single stem and there are some that are branching. And those are the things that you have to like start building your own little database of those varieties that you grow or a book is what I recommend to my students. Um, so that's pinching friends and let's get rid of this and I will bring. So I wanted to talk about heat for just a minute because I didn't talk about that since we were talking about so much um, sunflower information. Hey, do y'all see this? Look at this. We are building an amazing dried rack from our show flowers. Most of them go up there. Um, anyway, so that's really cool, right? Um, so before I show you what all is behind me, um, I want to talk about heat. And something I shared on social media this week, somebody was saying that how they just can't take this incredible intense heat. Well, frankly, friends, none of us can really take it. Um, and so there's some things you have to do. And let me tell you what the number one thing is. We learned this, I guess it was probably almost eight or nine, 10 years ago. We were still in high production. I had a lot of people that worked for me. And in June, very abnormal, we got like five days of above 100 degrees in June. That just, I mean, we hit 100 around here occasionally in the height of summer, like July and August but never in June. And it was so hot. We couldn't even cut flowers. I mean, you cut flowers, they wilt before you can get them to the bucket, right? So that is the year that, I mean, and I was a wild woman because we had so many commitments. All of our flowers were sold. We had, you know, that's when we were producing 10 to 15,000 stems of flowers a week from our field, right? And our field was only an acre and a half. And of that acre and a half, only a third was actually being harvested. The rest of it was either just being planted or getting ready to be unplanted. A lot of flowers from a small space, friends. I mean, people just so grossly overestimate how much land you need. But anyway, so I was like a wild woman during this time. I was so concerned that we couldn't get our work done. What was I going to do? You know, the payroll, you have taxes, you have obligations of customers. So that is when we started. Um, we, during that time, everybody reported to work, are you ready, at 5 a.m. At 5 a.m., we're on the cusp of the sunrise, and at 5 a.m., we have lights all over this building. Buckets can be filled and prepared. Seedlings can be watered, which all of that's like a first morning job. Um, and so when the sun does crack, you have trailers full of buckets, and Here's the thing, friends. First off, it's like air conditioning between 5 a.m. and 10 a.m. in the morning when you're going to those days where you have heat advisories. Um, you just can't believe how cool it is. I mean, it still isn't cool, but it is so much cooler. And the thing is this, once you do it one or two days, that's what gets your tail out of bed in the morning. I mean, to roll out of bed at 4 a.m., I mean, for me, it would be 4 a.m. because I just have to walk across the driveway. But the people that worked for me had to get up even earlier than that. But here's the thing. We knocked off at lunchtime. You know, they came to work at 5. We had a mid at that 10 o'clock hour. We would have snacks, and, you know, go to the building or in the shade have a 20 minute break, drinking water. Um, and depending on the heat, if there was a heat advisory, we did inside work. We have, I have a carport where our bucket washing station is. We were inside seed starting, that kind of stuff. You know, we tried to really make the most. And here's the other thing. I didn't write this on social media because I didn't know how people would take it. We also, I had kind of like a moratorium on no chit chat. Friends, you don't know how much that slows you down. But besides that, it sucks your energy out. When you are trying to beat the heat, which is the story of my life as a flower farmer, the second I get up in the morning, I'm constantly thinking, all right, what do I have to do to get, you know, what crop do I have to cut first for the heat, which this, that, and the other. You can manage it. We did it. We cut thousands and thousands of stems of flowers each harvest day, which was Mondays and Thursdays, um, in the mornings between five and 10 with enough hands, fresh and focused and have, I mean, if for instance, you would never not have your buckets washed and clean and ready 
to be just picked up and filled the next morning. We never fill the night before because of wildlife, birds and stuff getting in them and drowning. You would never do that. Our buckets are washed and set where they we turn them upside down. Um, so friends, you can manage the heat and you have to be safe and you have to take care of your employees. And typically if you can start that early in the morning, um, but you have to knock them off early. You can't expect them to stay there all day. So now I'm going to go back and um, see what questions we might have here. Hello, everybody. So Anne says my um, first, so she's one of the lucky ones. Anne got pro cut peach sunflowers. Peach is, that's what's behind me. That is the new the newest color to the Pro Cut family, which I now, I think that makes 13 colors. It bloomed this week and they're now my favorite. Hooray for strong necks. Hallelujah. Let me show y'all. That was one of the questions that everybody had because not all the Pro Cut special colors have strong necks. Look, y'all, they have super strong necks. They are like orange. Um, and, you know, I don't know that I think Oh, I got spiders. I don't know that I think peach when I look at this color, but it is definitely a different color than the other um, sunflowers. And that's one of the things that I'm doing weekly on our Fridays at noon Gardener's Workshop live shopping show. That's where this whole background is full of our harvest is comparing colors. That's one of the things that you will learn about. So be sure you grab our phone app. You can search your app store, Gardener's Workshop, Live Shop. Download it. Join us on Friday, friends. We are having so much fun. We had Michael Jackson joining us this last week. Anyway, it's a ton of fun. Um, so I'm glad they worked out for you. So let's see. I'm having trouble with my zinnias. They are sprouting great, but then they go leggy and are falling over. They did great last year. Don't know what I'm doing wrong. Anytime anything is getting leggy, that means a low light situation. Whether if you're if they're under grow lights, you need to be certain that depending on the light you have, the, we if you have T8 or T12s, those are the ones that don't get hot. They just get warm. They need to be right above your seedlings, like two inches within of the canopy. Um, if you have T5s, they need to be a little bit further. But leggy always means low light. And if you have a um, Joel, a um, grow lights that aren't really grow lights, they're regular lights. We know that we have to change our light bulbs every single year, even if they're not burnt out. That's one of the great things about grow lights. You don't have to do that intended. They're just much brighter. So that is definitely what I would be. I'd be barking up that tree. Um, so Jeannie Ann says, counting the days to sign up for day's class. You know, friends, one of the things that folks um, I just did, and I'll, I'll preempt this, um, the podcast is not out yet. I just did it this earlier this week. If you guys know who Nicole Pitt is of um, Flower Farm Hill, I, I'm sorry, I have so many farm names in my mind right now. Nicole is the one that just really um, has just, she's only been growing for four years and has just scaled her business. And she, I interview, I did a podcast with her just the other day. It has, it'll come out next week or the week after, I think. Um, and she is the one that coined the phrase, Dave in my back pocket. And we talked about the fact that what people don't realize about our big school courses is, well, all of our courses, you have them for life. You can go back and watch them over and over again as many times. Because what you don't realize is when you take the course, you're going to be so overwhelmed. You know, you're going to pay attention to where you are in your business or in your garden for right now. But next year or the year after or the year after, as you add more crops or you're, you're at your you're ending, you know, you, you need to split something. You can go back and watch the course and see what Dave has to say about it. Um, I just can't tell you how valuable all the courses are in that way. But Dave's course is super valuable because it's set up like an encyclopedia. Tulips. You can go to the tulips and go right to what you need to know about which flower for when. It's just so awesome. And um, Jeannie, I know you'll absolutely love it. So um, Jesse has put the direct link to the sunflowers here. 
and we have folks from all over. So Nessie says, can you use only potting soil without compost? I've heard many do that. Well, let me tell you what compost, most potting, well, all potting soils typically are sterile. We don't use anything sterile. Sterile means there's no life in there. Um, there's no anything. The compost aids everything. I mean, the same reason you want to add compost to your garden. So sure, you can do that. But why would you do that? First off, compost is typically less expensive um, to buy it in a bag. And it cuts your, 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 it doubles the amount of potting soil that you get. And it makes your potting soil better. Not only is it nutrition, it is water holding. It's got microbes in it. I mean, it's all, that's like the secret sauce to our whole farming operation is the things and the components that compost bring. And it does the same thing for your um, seed mix in plug trays. I mean, our soil blocking mix, the ready-made as well as the recipe that we all tell people they can, you know, make it from are all compost based. Um, that's the secret sauce. And so that's why. So somebody was having video trouble, hopefully. So Amber, what a great question. What else are y'all seeds starting this time of the year? This definitely depends on how, you know, when you're, you're based on your first fall frost. You know, we have like a six month warm season growing period here where I am in southeastern Virginia. So we are still every once a month starting right up until mid July, starting most of the annuals that we start over and over again. And I'll show you a couple of those. So um, these are here is our compo our compost, our cosmos that were. I almost poured water right into my computer, y'all. Um, these are compo um, I really stuck, y'all. Um, Cosmos, and these were started May 19th. These will be hardened off. Um, they're in hardening off. They've already been out for, let's see, today's Saturday. They went out the first of the week, so like the end of this coming week. They could be planted outside, y'all. We're growing all 14. This is um, the Cosmo Apricotta. Um, which is the newest color that just came online with our store. And we grow are growing all 14 of the different varieties that you can find on our store. Cosmos, when you learn the secret to when to harvest them much earlier than most people do and how to use them in your bouquets, um, people adore Cosmos. So we're continuing to start just tons of Cosmos as well as this is Gumpfrina. Y'all, we start, I mean, this is the Gumpfrina purple. This purple is a flower. And this is one of the things, y'all, that when you join our shopping show on, Sat on Fridays at 12 noon Eastern time, we show the blooms. You know, here I show what the seedlings look like. But on Fridays at the shopping show, that's where I show here is the purple blooms and help you to figure out, you know, tell you when the best time to plant it. We grow all the different colors of Gumpfrina. Gumpfrina is an incredibly useful annual, warm season annual. Um, and again, all of these guys are being started every month from the very beginning. And then here is, these were just started May 25th. So that was just what? A little bit more than a week ago. This is Celosia Sunday Green. Oh my gosh, y'all. The first planting of these are already blooming out in our garden and they are gorgeous. I am always in love with neutral colors. That means that they can make other things in the bouquet pop. And these guys um, are still in the grow room. The other ones that I've already shown you have been out on the porch hardening off. But these guys are still in the grow room because they can't quite take a lot of wind yet. They won't be moved out of the grow room and out um, onto the carport probably until um, maybe 10 days or so. So this is um, Celosia High Z, which is one of the plumes that I absolutely adore because the stem, you might be able to see the stem is red. And the foliage is green and it's got a magenta spike. And sometimes the spikes, these were hybridized um, from a really gorgeous coxcomb, you know, a bazillion years ago by Mr. Kramer. 
or actually not Mr. Kramer, it was somebody else, but Mr. Kramer found it and produced the seed for a long time. Um, these are a color of magenta and those funky kind of get a little bit of flat at the top. Oh, we just love them for bouquets. Um, and they're great branchers. Totally love high Z. And then this last one I'll show you is another. This is um, the other spike that we grow, Selway. Um, and this is the terracotta. And as I mentioned, all of our first plantings are just get on the verge of blooming. So that's what we'll be starting to see. I don't know if we'll have any this coming Friday, but the Friday after that, friends, stand by for, I mean, so much abundance and gorgeousness. This coming Friday on the Shop and Show, our Rudbeckias, you know, we, we grow like a bunch of different Rudbeckias. They're all amazing cut flowers. Um, I'm going to be showing them and talking about how we grow them. These were all fall planted that are blooming now, but we have a lot of experimenting going on here on the farm. Look at these. Aren't they beautiful? And these were started May 23rd. So whatever that makes them, I'll let y'all do the counting. Um, so they are just really, really beautiful. Um, so we are continuing. The heat mat is full of all of the zinnias have been started all over again. There's a ton more celosias, um, azuratum, all of the warm season annuals, in addition to our weekly sunflowers, friends, are being started over and over and over and over again. And we'll be doing that again. Um, so this is early June. So what happens as Bobo, Bobo is our seed starter. Christine is our planter and I'm the cutter. And of course, we're not in production anymore. We only cut for our show. Um, and so everybody has their job. And so Bobo, as soon as she's finished, you know, she just finished the late May zinnias. So now she has started back on the cycle again, and it'll take her three to four weeks to get them all done. That's the cycle of succession planting, friends. You're not doing anything all at one time. That is really, really the secret. And if you're having trouble wrapping your head around succession planting, I would recommend my book, Vegetables Love Flowers, which is really a book that's a snapshot of my style of gardening and farming, uh, about pest controlling that I, how I do that and um, how to set up your cutting garden and can be really, really um, useful. And so that's what we're starting this time of the year. Question. What is the secret to the rich black soul blocks? I oftentimes get speckled white mold on mine. What am I doing wrong? Well, Honeycomb Hill Flower Farm. I still can't believe I can't remember um, Nicole's farm name. I think it's Flower Hill, New York. Anyway, um, whenever you have algae or mold grow on your blocks, that can only happen if the blocks are staying wet all the time. And I will tell you that I just showed you um, here that, well, I'm not going to show you. I have a little bit of brown mold or algae. I'm not sure which it is, which is the correct term on that celosia that I showed you. That's the right size to plant. It happens sometimes. First off, I have never found it to be detrimental to the plants. However, here's what is detrimental to the plants is the same problem that caused the mold is the blocks stay wet 24 seven, right? So it's not that the mold prevents germination or causes dampening off. It is the same thing that causes the mold or algae to grow that causes those problems. So the way that I handle that is that when you water, you should water every morning. When you go to water in the morning, your block should be dry. There is a great watering video on our website, thegardenersworkshop.com. Go to the resources, go to the video guide, and go to how to, or so all things soil blocking. And it's right on there. It shows how I water um, and how I ensure that I'm not leaving water in the tray, but yet I am sure that the trays get completely, that the blocks get completely wet all the way through. Because friends, my room goes over 95 degrees this time of the year, and I only have to water in the morning. Mine don't go down. They don't dry out because I am sure to water them thoroughly. So I would check that out. But if you raise your air temperature in the room so that in 
that helps to create vegetative growth. And when your plants are growing, they suck more water. And so that means your blocks dry out quicker. And that's the whole cycle that you really, really want to, um, um, if you really want to up your growing, your indoor growing space, Will y'all be doing the special on Dave in your course this year if I buy them together? We will not have a bundle together, but here is the special. Once you buy any of our online courses, doesn't matter, big school, regular, on demand, that makes you a special family. That makes you a family member of the TGW family. That means you're part of us. And once you make that purchase, that puts you on an email list that you will get emailed a special link with a $50 off for any of our big schools. Doesn't do anything to any of our other on-demand courses, but for our big schools, once you are a family member, Amber, that means you get $50 off. Um, and so we aren't able to bundle them anymore. They're just, these courses are just too far apart in timelines. It's just made for kind of a crazy mess. Um, so that is, we will be given the family, special family discount. Um, and so when you buy any online course on demand or a school that makes you a TGW family member, that means that when a school's enrollment opens, you would get a special email or probably three, I would think, probably one at the first of the week, one at the middle of the week, and one at the end. They're only open for five days. So you would get it on one, three, and five, I think, or something like that. And then in that email is the link you need to use. You can't go through our website or through any social media. You have to go through that link because it's $50 off because you're a family member. And um, so... That is really, we love um, rewarding the people that are just supporting our all that we do. And that's what we're doing this year. Andy, please explain again how you harvest Lincianthus, especially about cutting the center bloom. Also, at what temperature should we stop harvesting for the day? Sometimes it's 90 here by 10 a.m. So, all right. So, Lizzie Anthus. So, first off, um, depends on how busy you are as a grower. Um, back when I was first starting to grow Lizzie, I did do something with that. What she's talking about, Lizzie Anthus, the first bloom to bloom is usually pretty deep down in the plant. So, if my fingers are all little buds of Lizzie Anthus, well, down there in the middle is where the first bloom blooms, the first bud opens. And I used to like go out, I used to do all kinds of things. I used to go out there and center cut, you know, you, the stem would only be about this long. You just go out there and cut them and we'd make little sweetie bouquets. We would definitely sell them at the farmer's market, but they are a pain in the neck because they're so short. You have to have special containers to keep them in water. They take up space. It depends on how hungry you are. So then I grew out of that. I just didn't have time to do it. Then I learned that I don't do anything to that center bloom. I just leave it out there and wait for all these other buds to start opening. And I cut Lysianthus. My goal is to have three to four blooms open on a stem because that is the most value for your customer. The voluptuousness of a stem, um, you know, definitely affects the cost, the, the fee that you charge per stem. And no, I'm not going to be talking about that on here. That is something I talk about in flower farming school. Um, but the more blooms, the better the value is. And so I but you have to like, because I grow out in a field, right? No hoop house. You have to like check the weather make sure you can wait. If there's two blooms open and rain is coming, I'll cut them. But that's not what I want to do. Hopefully that will help you. Also, what temperature should she stop harvesting for the day? I mean, we definitely harvest in 90 degrees, not 96 degrees. Um, you know, so it's not always available, but certainly your flowers will benefit from getting cut earlier in the morning and get them out of that heat. Um, and we just change up our whole system when those kind of conditions come. You know, there might have been back when we were doing that 5 a.m. thing, we had somebody that was not just running flowers. I mean, we had six harvesters then. Um, we had a runner, somebody, I mean, because undoubtedly, 
according to him, back it was a young man, a college boy that was home for summer this particular year, who pointed out that I cut probably like three times faster than anybody else. Well, I've been doing it for a long time, right? So he was my runner. He would periodically run for other people, but typically because I'm cutting all that giant coxcomb, which can't hold but so much, I would cut them and lay them in the pathways and he's running back and forth, getting them to buckets. Then we had somebody else that was running either that trailer into the building to unload it in the heat or we had um, we definitely had a shade cloth over it over the trailer um, but there's just a lot of things you can do yes you can continue to cut into the heat if you take all these special precautions but if you're not doing any of that then man you better stop early so does that help i hope all right y'all i see jesse is putting all kinds of links oh Flower Hill Farm. Holy cow, Nicole. I am so sorry. Um, Nicole was one of my students and one of Dave's students, and we're just so proud of everything. Have y'all watched her YouTube channel? Um, it is Flower Hill Farm, um, and I can't wait for y'all to hear the podcast that I've done with her, and she has some really exciting things coming up, which we don't talk about because it's secret so far, but um, Nicole is really pretty awesome, and I love, 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 and just so very proud of everything that she's done. Question, sometimes my seedling leaves turn yellow at the bottom leaves. Am I over or under watering? Potentially, maybe, or too much fertilizer? Maybe. Um, should I cut back? So first off, we I always follow instructions on fertilizer, but other than overwatering, the most oftentimes when stuff starts getting ugly in the tray is it's been there too long. You know, you might be sitting on them. Zinnias, we plant it two to three weeks. Sunflowers, two to three weeks. Celosia, four weeks. I mean, even though those snaps that I showed you still look pretty healthy, that's pretty unusual. Um, but they didn't have a lot of vegetative growth at the top, right? So it could be any of those things that you've mentioned. Can you mention the journal you keep your seed starting area and categories you include with each variety? Um, that's kind of a deep dive, deep dive, Shelly. That is something that I definitely share with my flower farming school students. They actually get spreadsheets with all that kind of information. Um, but people are, everybody's always looking for somebody to share with them when they should start stuff. You have to create your own seed starting um, calendar or journal or whatever you want to call it, database for your first and last frost dates. That's what it's really all about. And then not every, I mean, what grows great for me here in the South, people in New England, even though they have summers, does not grow so great. So that's why it's really hard. Um, and so that is kind of a deep dive and that's where you would get all that information from me. So I see that Jesse has, um, shared about our app in here. So let's read about Ariel's. We've taken a hit after hit this spring, losing half of everything to wind and heat. We have hoops, light cloth and sandbags now. Do you think mulching with straw would help the seedlings transition to our field with fewer casualties? So if you're talking about, um, if you're planting into Bio360, so we got caught off guard too. So meaning that when we make beds early in the season for our first warm season tender annuals, um, we are planting, you know, we're pushing the envelope. We're trying to get them while nights are still cool. So we'd put the black side up on the film. Well, all of a sudden it got like 95 degrees and we had all these black beds. And we knew that if we planted our seedlings into there, it was really gonna toast them. And I don't know if you caught some of my social media um, posts of how I made half moon row covers, um, bed, tunnels where it, it created shade in the high noon and after on those beds. And I am really happy to say just last night, I picked up all of the weight bags and the row covers and the hoops off of those beds. And I bet we had 95% survival rate. Um, so I totally think that when you plant, then let's talk about these other beds that we have down here, the no-till beds, where we just laid Bio360. That's the biodegradable film that I love so much, y'all. We just laid it on top of the bed. And we topped it with a light dressing of mulch to just kind of hold it in place. 
what the film does, it's like putting newspaper down, but it's just easier, y'all. It blocks all the light for the weed seeds. But by putting mulch on top of it, it took away the heat. And we just planted the eucalyptus and two or three, um, a bunch of zinnias, our big 50 foot cutting garden kit that um, we're growing this year, along with a bunch of people. You can find that on our website. So you can downgrade the, the air temp or the surface temperature by doing some of that stuff. So you might, um, Ariel, so I'm not sure if that's what happened to you, but sounds like maybe that's um, potentially what did. So Sarah says, love watching Flower Hill grow inspirational. She is. Nicole is an up and coming flower grower. She's only been growing for four years um, and she will share with you that um, our courses changed her path. You know, um, she shared on the podcast that um, she said, told me what she did the first year, just like the rest of us, when you're kind of like the blind leading the blind. And she said, I can remember watching your course and saying, oh, so this is how a flower farmer is supposed to, a flower farm is supposed to work and look um, and how it just changed it for. Her. So yeah, I am um, totally love her you know, she was a TV personality before she was a flower farmer. I mean, that she just does great stuff. Question, should I be getting potting mix? Is that the same as potting soil? Yes. Okay to have miracle Grow in it? Eh. We just don't use any conventional type of fertilizers. Um, so, friends, we're, I mean, I'm at the end of our hour now, but I will wrap it up with this. And if I didn't get to your question, um, you can join. I have a closed Facebook group where we have all kinds of great conversations. It's called The Flower Farmer Show. You have to request to join. And if you're an up-and-coming flower farmer or already established, we want you there. That's what we kind of talk about. Um, we have a lot of great conversations, but here it is in a nutshell. We do not use any conventional, that means anything blue like miracle Grow or those types of fertilizers in our garden or in our seed starting. Conventional fertilizers are based on, um, have a lot of salt in them. And I don't know if you have ever with your kids or maybe done it yourself, put salt on slugs. It just shrinks them up and kills them. That's what the salts of condition of conventional fertilizers do to all the microorganisms that we are killing ourselves to add to our potting mixes and our garden, y'all. So when you use conventional um, man-made fertilizers, it is damaging what you're working so hard to build. When you use organic based fertilizers that are like chicken litter base and seaweed and fish and all that stinky stuff, it doesn't have that component. And so you're actually feeding these microorganisms that are in the soil or in your soil blocks or in your cell portrays. You're feeding the things that take care of your plants. So that's the big difference. So I would look for potting mix or potting soil that has absolutely nothing in it. You'll know it because it'll be the cheapest thing there right? And then buy yourself a bag of any kind of finished compost, composted manure. They have all different kinds, pot composted mushroom compost. All of any of those are the good stuff. Um, so friends, I'm wrapping it up. I just want to remind everybody, I hope you'll join me for the shopping show on Friday. That's where you're going to see all the blooms, how they look, why you grow them, how you grow them. I'm feeling a sneezing attack. Come on, friends. Um, Head over to thegardenersworkshop.com to sign up for our farm news. And friends, next week we're having special guests here. Can't wait to have them here for you to hear from them. Um, as well as, you know, set the timer. Dave's course goes on sale June 9th. And um, we would love to have you join. And then, so I think that's Friday to Tuesday, I think is when his course um, enrolls. And it's once a year, friends. It doesn't happen again later. School starts the 1st of July and it goes through mid-August. You have access to Dave each week in his live Q&As to help you figure out what to order if you're at that stage and how much it will blow your mind, friends. 
everything from growing in crates, growing in the ground, growing in hoop houses, growing in greenhouses year round. Dave was a flower farmer of 20 years that grew, grew year round in Maryland, very cold winters for the most famous DuPont Circle Farmer's Market. That's the Washington, D.C. Farmer's Market. That is the who's who. Dave was one of the foundational flower growers there. He produced year round. The man, y'all, I have goosebumps when I talk about Dave. Dave has scholarship at the, AC, the ASCFG, the Cut Flower Growers Association. We have a scholarship for Dave Dowling. That's how significant he is. It'll be the best 600 bucks you have ever spent. And we do have a payment plan if you need that. Um, but it will be an investment you will never be sorry that you made. And I'll, this is all I'm going to say. And then we're signing off is if you don't enroll this year, how are you going to change your business? Scale it, build it, learn how to grow stuff better and learn how to save so much darn money if you don't take the course. All right, friends, till we meet again. Ciao.